Good morning. So we begin then, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known from you. No secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. receives a answer from God in response to his repeated feelings and complaints about his misfortune. A reading from the book of Job. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkness, darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your lions like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have this understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Oh, who stretched the line upon it? Or oh, what were its spaces sunk? Or oh, who led, laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sung together and all the heavenly being shouted for joy? A word of the Lord. Thank you. Yeah. We'll do the song by half verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You wrap yourself with light as with a cloak. You 
lay the beams of your chambers in the waters above. Make the clouds of your chariot. You make the winds your messengers. You have set the earth upon its foundations. You covered it with the deep as with a mantle. At your rebuke, they fled. The voice of your thunder They went up into the hills and down the valleys beneath. You set the limits that they should not pass. They shall not over the earth. O Lord, how manifold are your works. Through his obedience to God's will, Jesus became the new high priest for all eternity. Still, he knows and has compassion for our human weaknesses. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only from full by God, just as Aaron does. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today you, I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Chesnagel. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who were saved. Designated by God, I preach according to the order of Melchizedek, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus called them and said to them, You know that. 
that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be the slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Messiah. They had no idea, really, on 
until all the things happened. Well, what kind of Messiah Jesus really was going to be. They had no idea what kind of a king he was going to be. They had no idea at all that suffering was going to be a part of this whole picture. But oftentimes, people miss what God wants to give, and what God wants us to have, because we cling so tightly to our understanding, and we're not willing to either change or at least be challenged to open our hands and open our minds and hearts to receive what, is, what it is that God wants to give us. That was the problem with Job. You know, in all of these chapters that we've heard over these several weeks, Job has been laying out his complaint with God because I haven't done anything wrong. Why am I being punished? Bad things are not supposed to happen to good people. I haven't done anything wrong. And in spite of his friends and other people and his wife, coming to him and saying, you must have done something. Job wouldn't hear of it. And so now in today's reading, God is, is there and says, okay, Job, but now you want to talk? Let me tell you a few things. And he tells him by challenging him, saying, basically, when I created the world, did I consult you? Was it necessary for you to, to be there so that I knew what I was supposed to be doing? Can you tell me how all of these things were put together? What God was doing there was, you know, really pointedly showing Job, you are in an area that you will not have an answer that you can understand. Because from chapter 38, to the rest of the book, well, at least through chapter 41, God continues to speak to Job, and even at times, Job begins to speak back to God, but interspersed with what God has, has said to him already. And it's obvious that Job is now in a, in a crisis because he knows that God is challenging him and telling him, you know, you just don't have the ability to understand this mystery of why bad things happen to good people. And he never does get a straight answer from God. So Job was being challenged to let go of this idea that only good should happen to the good and only bad should happen to the bad. And if he could do that, then he could come to a newer understanding of relationship with this God. He could be more a force for good and not just be looked at with jealousy by other people because he had so much. So whatever happened to Job thereafter, he knew where he belonged in God's scheme of things. And where he didn't belong and what wasn't going to be revealed to him. But he had to be willing to accept that. The apostles, they had to be willing to accept what Jesus was teaching them, what they were being shown. Because they all had ideas about what it meant to have a Messiah. And for all of those who are Jewish, that meant a particular thing. And Jesus says, you know, I am in your midst as one who serves. I have come to serve and not to be served and to give my life a ransom for many. And they had to think about that. They had to grapple with that because, you know, just like when Peter claims or proclaims that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus says, you know, yeah, thank God that, you've, that you, know, you have been given this illumination, this, this revelation. 
but understand what it means. And then Peter said, oh, no, 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 you're not, you can't possibly be handed over to the, to the powers, you can't be handed over, because that's not what a Messiah is. And Jesus calls Peter, Satan, obstacle, stumbling block, you're getting in my way, you don't understand. And with the other apostles, they just couldn't quite get their heads around it until Jesus dies and then is raised from the dead and then the Holy Spirit comes down upon them. That's finally when they begin to understand. But they had to continue to let go of their ideas, let go of their, their prejudgments, their prejudices, their their uh, just their way of looking at everything that it had to be just like this. Otherwise, it would be a contradiction of what the scriptures said. And that's so much of why people in Jesus' time rejected him because he was not doing things the way they wanted him to do them because they thought and they understood the whole thing and they didn't grasp it at all. So for us, one of the reasons why a lot of times we don't grow in our faith, don't you know, progress in our, in our relationship with God is because we cling to so many different things. Our hands are closed, our fists are clenched, holding on for dear life about how things should be. Might be particular ideas that we have about other people. It may be incidents that have happened to us in our lives that we won't forget nor forgive. It could be that we cling very tightly to what we have, our possessions, whatever. Particularly if we have had difficulty getting to the point that we're at in our life now and we're not about to part with anything very easy. And yet the Lord continues to say to us that those things that you cling so tightly to are the things that keep you from growing. It's like even in the situation that uh, I and my family find ourselves in right now, and not to sound cold or, or anything about it, but being challenged with the things that are happening to, to Linda, and I'll elaborate in the announcements, is, is telling us that we need to let go of the outcome that we want and hopefully it would be the same that God wants in time. But it's a difficult place to be. But yet that's what we have to do in order to grow into our faith in whatever it may, may happen. So either we'll be even more grateful to God or we'll be able to accept God's will, whatever it may be. But that's the difficulty. And even Jesus experienced that in his humanity. And that's the whole thing in the letter to the Hebrews. The letter to the Hebrews goes over and over again what it meant for Jesus to be one like us and everything except for sin. That he knows our life from the inside out and he knew what it was like to suffer. And he grew because of knowing what it was like to suffer. He let go of his divinity in order to embrace our humanity so that he could bring us back to the way we were created to be at the beginning. And so this is an ongoing challenge. This is what the Lord keeps saying to us. Let go of all of these things that you cling so tightly to or the things you want to control because there's something more that I want you to have or there's something new that you need to see. Job had to learn the hard way from a direct address from God. Jesus understood 
our life from the inside out because he lived it in everything except for sin. John and James and the other ten apostles and the disciples standing around them had to learn the hard way what it meant to let go of their preconceived notions of what it meant to have a Messiah and what they could do about having their place in the sun with them. And so we do too in our own lives. And it's not easy. It's not always a thing that we want to go through. But many of us have to go through it. And our willingness to go through it can help us to grow in our faith, to grow in this relationship with God, to grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and why it is that we follow him and what it all means in the end. Even when there are things beyond our immediate comprehension. So in the Eucharist today, Jesus comes once again to us. He gives us himself. He empties himself by giving us his body and his blood in Holy Communion. So that we are being filled with his life. We're being renewed in his love. We're being told how to continue to follow him faithfully. And we're being reminded as well that we already share by virtue of our baptism in Christ's death and resurrection. We are already partakers of his divine nature. And so we can become better servants, letting go of the idea that maybe being a Christian or being in a particular position in the church or in the parish or whatever gives us some kind of importance. And rather see that what we are called to do whoever we are, whatever our vocation is, is ultimately to be servants of putting somebody else first before ourselves. We do that in our families, with spouses, with our children, with our siblings, with our neighbors, people that we work with, those that we you know, associate with one way or another. We put their need before our own. Then we are letting go of that idea that we've got to look out for number one and not to neglect ourselves or not to pretend that it doesn't matter what we do or that we have to, you know, that we don't have to care about ourselves, but that the other comes first because that's how Jesus lived his life and that's how we are called. Because after all, we are part of his life, by his doing, by his gift. And he will continue to empower us and will continue to give us what we need. Let us now profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the of all that we have seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and not just by him. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and he seated at the right hand. He will come again to order
are visibly glorified, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. O oh God, who knows and loves us best, we thank you for the great gift of your presence among us. Hold us close when we struggle with the noise of life. Call us to the quiet place so that we hear your voice and come to understand your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep your church rooted in your word and grounded in your love. Guide our leaders as they walk beside us, supporting us in our journey of faith. We pray for Justin of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Paula, our bishop elect, Chilton, our assistant bishop, and Mike, our rector. We pray for the Anglican Church of the Province of West Indies. It's our bishop, bishops, clergy, and lady, and our companion diocese of Southeast Mexico and Rain South Sudan. And for the growth and vitality of the congregation of the Diocese of Chicago, bless those in our parish celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. David Sherman, Justin Musiki, and Jim Assey, Sr. And anniversaries, Jerry and Gretchen Hodgberger. Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give those in authority, especially Joseph, the President of the United States, and all federal, state, and local officials, and the imagination and determination for peace between peoples, of plenty, of plenty for all, of justice for everyone. Even those who are forgotten. God, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. In places where famine, weather disasters, war, civil unrest, persecution, and violence have destroyed lives and drained people of hope, we pray for those who suffer loss, as well as those who seek them to relieve their distress. God in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for healing for those close to us, especially all on the intercessory prayer list, those listed in the intention books and in this week's bulletin, and those we now know. Jim. Assure them of your goodness that never ends, and of your grace that surrounds them on every side. We pray also for those who are, are voiceless, who have never known you, who are imprisoned by fear, that you witness to them your steadfast love. God in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray for those who, who are born today as well as those who are being welcome home to your eternal kingdom, especially Alice Palmer, and those names we wish to mention now. May your will be each of, may your will for each of those you love be fulfilled here on earth and in the life to come. God in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> now we offer the prayer for the mission of our parish. Come inside the front line. Loving God, through your grace, guide us, the people of Calvary Episcopal Church, to joyfully carry out our mission of growing faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may develop the living faith that deepens our understanding of you and strengthens our awareness of the needs of others. May we be a transforming life within our parish and within the community. All this we ask in the name of your Son, 
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have heard and by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors since ourselves. We are truly sorry that we have been confessed. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may be alive in your way and walk in your ways to the glory of your Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Amen. Amen. Today's the uh, third Sunday of the month, and uh, so any money in the open plate today will be for the rector's discretionary fund. The altar flowers today have been generously given by Minnie Titus Glover in gratitude to God for her daughter Valerie on her birthday. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. That's from Psalm 20, verse 4. Um, just a reminder that in uh, a couple of weeks, we will observe uh, All Saints Day on the 1st of November, and then also on the following Sunday, so the 7th. Uh, and is, as is our custom, we will remember on that Sunday, November the 7th, uh, all those who have died since last November the 1st, since last All Saints Day. So if you have a loved one that you want us to remember that's passed in the last year or so, please just let us know. You can either call the office and leave a message for Dave, or you can email if that's your preference. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, and those instructions are in the bullet, by the way. Also, uh, on the 2nd of November is All Souls Day, where we will commemorate all those um, who have died. So if there are any names on the lists that go back a number of years that you wish to omit, or any that you want to add, somebody that died a long time ago, um, you can just, again, follow the instructions and contact us and we'll make sure that all of that is ready uh, in time. And uh, we would like to have all of the names, all the names that you want removed by October the 31st. Um, <clears throat> Next, uh, next Sunday, the fourth Sunday of the month, uh, there will be a Red Bull collection. And this coming week's Red Bull collection will be for the American Red Cross who've been engaged overtime this year with fires, drought, tornadoes, hurricanes, and floods. So the Red Cross uh, does a lot of work. And so we want to help. Uh, support that. So that will be in 
the Red Bull for next Sunday. Also, if you came through, uh, you noticed if you came through that way, uh, you, you should have noticed or will notice when you go out the African Team Ministries uh, artifacts from East Africa, primarily from Kenya. Um, and that we've had in the previous years. Uh, all the items are for sale. Uh, you can use a credit card uh, to, uh, to buy them if you wish. And they will be available yet next Sunday. Um, and all during the week that we set up, if you uh, are not able to today, but you will have something that you would like to purchase. And all the money uh, will go to support the work that they do. Uh, and that's uh, explained briefly, and we also had it in the bulletin last week. Now, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, about my, my life's condition, some of you may remember that she was diagnosed on the 16th of September with COVID-19. She could not take the vaccines. I, on the other hand, could and did. Uh, she couldn't take them because of allergic reaction. Well, one way or another, she got COVID, uh, was taken by paramedics to the hospital, which is where they diagnosed it. She spent a little over two weeks in Delmore, and on the 2nd of October, she was released to uh, Amida St. Joseph Hospital in Elgin for rehab. So she was on the rehab room. And uh, so she was in there over a week. And uh, last weekend, she began to have increasing problems with breathing. And so Monday or Tuesday, uh, they asked her about going on a ventilator and she decided to do that. So she's been on a ventilator since uh, the early part of last week. We also heard various things towards and as we were moving through the week that she was not being responsive. Uh, there was a discovery from an MRI that she had a stroke. Uh, uh, an ischemic stroke, so it was in the back of her brain uh, that seems to be affecting her vision on one side, her peripheral vision, uh, and also will have an effect on how she can move. Uh, but they are still very concerned, even though yesterday she was more responsive than she's been. Uh, a couple of our grandkids were in the service our home came home on leave there's another one coming so she you know nodded her head she moved her head she squeezed hands she did a variety of things that way uh, did it for me did it for uh, one of our daughters did it for her occupational therapy person and also for her nurse and uh, so whatever that means see but she is supposed to at the beginning of this week so tomorrow or tuesday i'm supposed to take her off the ventilator and do a tracheostomy so she would have uh, a trach for breathing but we don't and then she may have to be moved to another facility uh, where that uh, particular uh, form of treatment is their special. So we don't know what's going to happen with that, and we don't know other consequences. So uh, we will find out more probably tomorrow or Tuesday. And uh, when we know, we'll share that information. And also, some of you know Judy Warns, uh, who was a regular attender at 1015. Her son came um, towards the end of the week and told me that she had had a massive stroke herself. 
and that she was paralyzed on one side, and she's in uh, Central Page Hospital. What's going to happen? Nobody knows. But anyway, that's that's the latest, and I do, and I know she does too, appreciates more than words can say your prayers, your compassion, and your concern. Let's keep praying. And as a priest friend of mine reminded me in an email just this morning, regardless, prayer is never wasted. So. Okay, the offertory prayer then at the top of page 15. Yes, Michelle. What? How did she get it? I have no idea. The germs go where they want. That's what the doctor said. But she's been to the place. She's not been here. I don't know. The doctor can't say how she died. Nobody knows how she died. The offertory prayer at the top of page 15. Together, bring us, O oh gracious God, to praise you at your table with free and generous hearts, so that we may be set free from sin, you in spirit and in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I uh, also, I forgot to mention that uh, Susan Palmer's father-in-law, Hollis, uh, passed away uh, yes, early yesterday morning and, and out in Galesburg. It's, and uh, Susan and her husband, Ken, were there anyway um, for a family wedding that was to take place yesterday. Uh, so please keep Susan and Ken and her husband 
husband, father, uh, in your prayers to and pray for the close of Paulus' soul. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Christ you have made all things new and given us all a share in his fullness. Though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself and by shedding his blood on the cross, he brought peace for the whole creation. Therefore, he was exalted above all things, being made the source of eternal salvation for all who serve him. And so we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Amen.
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Alleluia. In union, blessed Jesus, with the Christian faithful across the world, gathered in every altar of your church where your blessed body and blood are offered this day, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory, and particularly for the blessings given me. I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in my heart in the fullness of your strength. Be my wisdom and guide me in right pathways. Conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness. And in the power of your gracious might, rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ.
the prayer after Holy Communion. Let us pray. We pray, we pray Lord, Lord, let our handling of heavenly things make us receptive to your presence, so that being blessed by you in this present age, we may be prepared for the blessings of the age to come, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a reminder to those who were born soon today, if you intend to receive communion via drive through please text me about what time you'll be coming between 11.45 and 12.30. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.